So next we'll look at the boundedness of our linear form, our right hand side. Uh, before we do that though, I, I noticed that I made a small mistake just a second ago. Um, so we had here an expression for Q, right? The, the, the ratio between uh, the, the gradient of phi that we retained in our expression and uh, the new Poincaré expression. Uh, but of course, Q is still multiplied by CP squared. So actually in my final expressions, I should have here CP squared. Okay, now we'll end up using this uh, uh, in just a second. So that's why I wanted to make sure that that was correct. So then the boundedness, the boundedness of our right hand side. So the question of our answer is, is uh, L of W bounded? And that meant that um, L of W, which was equal to the integral over the domain of this normalized force vector or force uh, normalized source function times W, if that is going to be smaller than or equal to uh, some constant, which we call the boundedness constant of L times the norm of W, and of course measured in the H1 sense. There we go. There we go. Okay, so that's what we're trying to prove. Now this is actually going to be very, very easy. Um, let me again start with L of W. So how can we interpret this, this integral of F and W? Well, this is just the L2 inner product between some function F and W. And we had some tricks involving uh, inner products. Those are the inequalities that we introduced in the beginning. And in this case, we're going to use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And we see here that we have uh, some, some inner product uh, of u and w in, in whatever uh, function space. And that's going to be smaller than the, uh, the norms of each one of those functions separately. So that's something we'll be able to use here. And if we use that, then we pretty much already end up with our expression. And we end up with, uh, this is going to be bound from above by our function f tilde in the L2 norm. And our function w in the L2 norm. Now, of course, we want to have something that is in the H1 norm. And that's kind of a similar problem as we ran into before. And that we obtain an expression involving norms uh, in certain function uh, measured in a, a certain sense. But we need actually a norm in the H1 sense. Now, for boundedness, that is actually uh, very easy to, to handle. Uh, and that is uh, because um, by definition of the H1 norm, which I'll, I'll just write down here again for completeness. This was the definition of our H1 norm. Well, clearly, if I only take this guy, then that is going to be equal to W in the H1 norm minus the leftover expression. Well, by definition of a norm, uh, the norm of any, any quantity is always going to be a larger than or equal to zero, which means that this is always going to be uh, bound from above by the norm of W itself in H1, right? So this is saying nothing more than if we measure the norm or the, the norm in L, the L2 norm of some function W, then that's going to be smaller than or equal to, uh, to the norm of that function in H1. And that makes sense because the norm in H1 is, is the sum of two different norms, one of them being the L2 norm. So this was uh, squares. Now, of course, we can still take the square root and then we would simply have uh, that the norm in L2 is going to be smaller than or equal to the norm in H1. And thereby, I can simply say that this is bound from above by the integral of f in L2 sense times the norm of w in H1. And that's what we're looking for, right? So this is, uh, this is going to be equal, or this is an expression equivalent to that one. So now we obtain an expression specifically for CL, our boundedness constant, as the L2 norm of our function f tilde. So this is going to be our boundedness constant. OK, 
Okay, so now we have boundedness of our uh, linear form, our right-hand side, and coercivity of our bilinear form, our left-hand side. And those were the two things that we needed to talk about the stability of the partial differential equation. Recall that for stability, we had the following expression. We had that if we measure the, our solution in an H1 sense, then that was going to be smaller than or equal to the ratio between the boundedness of the, the right-hand side, CL, and the coercivity of the constant of the left-hand side. And in our case now, this is going to be uh, equal to the norm of that function f in L2 divided by our coercivity constant. Yeah, so this is saying a little bit about how much our solution phi is going to change if we change our forcing function a little bit. And clearly, if we have a stable partial differential equation, uh, then uh, changes in our force function are not going to have a, a huge impact on our solution. And on the, the other side, if we have a very unstable partial differential equation, then small changes in our forcing or our source function may lead to a very different solution. So we'll have a large impact on, on phi. So that's, that's also what we pointed out uh, back then, that this coercivity in that sense sort of measures the stability of our partial differential equation, where a large coercivity constant means a stable uh, partial differential equation, and a small coercivity constant means a, uh, a very unstable or, or maybe towards the direction of chaotic, uh, a very chaotic partial differential equation. And again, that has nothing to do with finite element uh, technology. This is purely the mathematics behind the partial differential equation. And given that this is describing a physical system, this is really just about the physics uh, that we're talking about. Okay, so uh, let me then ex uh, substitute our expression that we obtained for CC. And then we obtain that this is going to be... Uh, bound from above by the norm maximum advection divided by our diffusion times um, 1 plus cp square over cp square times the norm of our function f. Okay, and again, a small change in f, how much is that going to affect our function phi? Well, this one, this fact is something that, again, is fixed based on our domain omega. So for a given physical domain, that's not going to change. These are our physical parameters. So we might ask ourselves, how much is it going to change based if we have a slightly uh, larger advection or a slightly smaller uh, diffusion? And then we see exactly what we kind of expected to see, that if we have a, a large advection and a small diffusion, then our physics are, are, are going to predict uh, a solution that is going to uh, be very dependent or fluctuative on our forcing. So I have some experiments uh, for this. I can show you some pictures. So this is, um, again, the, the differential equation that we looked at before, the diffusion, diff uh, diffusion equation on a square with a circular hole. And I'm running three types of experiments with different parameters, uh, different ratios between the advection and the diffusion. So we have here the advection A being constant for all experiments at a magnitude of 1.8. And I'm actually lowering the diffusion. So I'm starting with a pretty high diffusion of 200. Uh, then we have a moderate one of 2. And we have a small one of 0 0.02. And uh, the pictures that you're seeing at the top, those are pretty much the, the baseline pictures. So I have certain boundary conditions, but I, I have a forcing of zero. So I have no force. So after I've obtained these baseline equations or baseline solutions, which you can see already change, right? We, we, towards the right, we get these very steep layers here. There we go. We get these very steep layers here. Uh, so those are boundary layers. Um, 
And, and this will be our benchmark uh, or our baseline solution fields. What I'm going to do after that is I'm going to add some random fluctuation on the right hand side. So I'm going to change the force function f, which was zero first. I'm going to change that a little bit based on some, some random uh, combination of sines and cosines. I believe what I did here. So the question then becomes, how much does that change the solution? And as we expect from our analysis from just a second ago, we expect that if we have this, this uh, advection dominating case, the, the one on the right hand side, uh, that that's going to lead to a much more sensitive uh, solution than the one on the left. And I've, I've done this for 60 different types of uh, forcing function and plotting here, uh, the change in the the L2 norm and the change in the H1 seminorm. The H1 seminorm is, uh, that is purely uh, the gradient of phi in L2. Oops, that's for the next video. Um, and of course the, the L2 norm itself is, is just phi in L2. I don't know why it does that. Uh, and what we see is, is three different clusters of dots. And we have on the bottom the dot that, in, that corresponds to a, a, a relatively high diffusion, then in the center the one that corresponds to a moderate diffusion, and in the top the one that corresponds to a small diffusion. And this is going to be the, the relative difference in these norms, right? So what you see is that we have if we have a high a diffusion, then both the H1 norm and the L2 norm are changed by very little. Now oh, come on, why does it do that? Whereas if we start to decrease our diffusion, then a small fluctuation in the forcing function is going to uh, change the, the solution by an increasing amount, right? And that is precisely what we're predicting, or what we have predicted to see, that uh, once the advection starts to dominate, then small changes in our, in, our, in our boundary conditions, in our forcing data, are going to produce very different uh, solutions phi. And that is, that is our, our definition of the concept of stability, even though we're not talking about finite element uh, methods yet. So this is really just the stability of the physics. Uh, and, and that is going to have an impact on the stability of the numerical method that is trying to capture uh, the physics, of course. Okay, that's it for, the, for this video. Um, we, did, we talked about the boundedness of the right-hand side. That was actually a pretty straightforward proof. We could use Cauchy-Schwarz as, in, uh, as our uh, uh, inequality. To pretty much come up with the answer straight away. And we see now for the first time that this analysis actually gives us a predictive capability of what our, our, our partial differential equations uh, or how these partial differential equations uh, behave. And in the next video we'll actually talk about the boundedness of the bilinear form and we also needed that in order to get some idea of the error convergence of a numerical scheme. So thank you for your attention.